Howdy and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Short. I am on the faculty at Texas A&M University School of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar on the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act. Specifically, this webinar is going to relate to how the CARES Act has implications in the areas of housing, commercial real estate, and bankruptcy. Today's webinar is the fourth in a series of webinars produced by Texas A&M Law School that looks at various um, practical implications flowing from the CARES Act and the government's response to the current pandemic. In the first webinar, we looked at individual incentives under the CARES Act. The second webinar focused on small business incentives and the third webinar focused on healthcare implications under the CARES Act. Now, all of these recorded webinars, as well as the transcripts and presenter slides from them, are available online at tamulawanswers.info. That's tamulawanswers.info. In addition, the video and transcript and slides from today's webinar will be posted within a day, so you can get all of that information on our website. Today's webinar, as I said, will focus on three important topics addressed by the CARES Act that have been the subject of significant public interest and discussion. Residential housing, residential and commercial mortgages, and bankruptcy. Now, before I introduce our three panelists, I want to remind the audience of a few important points. Our panelists are all attorneys, and they will be discussing the law in general. However, nothing in this webinar should be considered as legal advice. Attendees should consult their own legal advisor to address their own unique circumstances and receive legal advice. And now let me uh, just introduce our three panelists and then I'll tell you a little bit about how the webinar is gonna be organized and then we'll get started. So uh, our three panelists are all faculty members at Texas A&M Law School. We have Lisa T. Alexander, professor and co-director of the Program in Real Estate and Community Development Law. We have Luz E. Herrera, professor and associate dean for experiential education. And finally, Wayne Barnes, a professor at the law school who teaches in the areas of bankruptcy, consumer law, and contracts. Now, in terms of organization, we will start with uh, allowing each of the panelists to talk a little bit about the CARES Act in their specific areas of expertise. Then I will pose a few questions to the panelists for them to respond to and discuss as a group. And then finally, I will turn to any questions that have been submitted by the audience, uh, and I will refer those out to the panelists to discuss. We will uh, finish right at one o'clock. So that's my primary task to make sure that we stay on time. Um, but if you have questions, please feel free to submit them online and we will get them forwarded to the panelists. All right, so first we have Professor Alexander. I'm trying to find. Okay, so thanks so much, Eric. Howdy, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about the housing and mortgage provisions of the CARES Act. And the CARES Act provides about $6 trillion in indirect and direct support to either homeowners or renters um, for housing needs. Uh, the first and most important thing to get across for homeowners is that the provisions of the CARES Act with respect to mortgages only apply to federally backed mortgages. And that raises the question, what is a federally backed mortgage? Um, a federally backed mortgage is any mortgage or deed of trust that's secured by a or subordinate lien on residential real property that has been insured, guaranteed, made, purchased, or securitized by one of the following federal agencies. And I'll talk about what all those verbs mean, but here are some of the agencies that provide federally backed mortgages. One are the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae. 
um, the Federal Housing Administration, HUD, there's a number of HUD programs, the Veterans Administration, number of USDA agriculture housing programs. Now, the important thing to know is many people who have a private loan made by a private bank, such as Bank of America, your loans are federally backed, even though a private entity made your mortgage. So they are usually, those loans are usually backed by the FHA, meaning that if you can't make your payments to the bank, the federal guarantees that they, the, the banker will get paid. And so therefore your mortgage may be insured or guaranteed by one of these federal agencies. Um, about 50% of the mortgages in the United States are backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And all told, probably about 70% of the mortgages in the United States are covered in some way by federal backing. However, if your loan is not federally backed, the provisions about which I'm speaking in the CARES Act do not apply to your loan because these provisions do not apply to purely private mortgage loans. So how do I know if my mortgage is federally backed? You have to call your mortgage servicer. And then you may think, well, who's that? What is a mortgage servicer? Um, and so this graphic attempts to kind of explain how mortgage servicing works. When a bank makes a loan to a homeowner or a borrower, the bank, even if it's a private bank or if it's a federal agency, usually doesn't keep the loan or hold on to the loan. The bank usually sells the mortgage loan, often if it's a federally backed loan, to the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae. Those, that, and those government-sponsored entities buy the loan, and then they don't even hold on to it. They sell it to um, another buyer through the securitization process. So usually a securitization trust will end up owning the original mortgage that the bank made to you. Uh, then the securitization trust wraps up a bunch of different mortgages into something called a mortgage-backed security, and then investors buy the security, and the investors are the ones who eventually receive your mortgage payments, your monthly mortgage payments, and that's the return on their investment. So you may ask, well, what does that have to do with me and my servicer? Well, the homeowner, makes their monthly payments to the mortgage servicer, which is a separate entity. It's usually a separate entity from the bank that made your loan, and it's usually a separate entity from the GSEs, the Securitization Trust, et cetera. So what's important is the person you have to call or the entity that you have to call is the mortgage servicer to whom you make your monthly payments. That's usually a private bank. So for example, you might have a loan from, have had a loan from Bank of America, but BB and T may be your servicer. They're the one who sends you your statements and make your monthly payments online or offline. The mortgage servicer will eventually give your mortgage payments to the securitization trust with a fee that they take. But for your purposes, finding out whether or not your mortgage is federally backed means you have to talk to your mortgage servicer. Um, as I said, most of the loans are federally backed, but you can go to the Fannie Mae website, the Freddie Mac website, or the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, all of which I've put uh, links in the, in the PowerPoint to, to find out if your mortgage is federally backed, meaning if your servicer doesn't return your calls, they're getting a lot of calls right now from everyone, uh, you can still look it up in these sources, okay? And it will tell you if your loan is federally backed. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau also has a lot of good information about this. However, if your loan is federally backed, your mortgage is federally backed, then there's two types of relief that you can receive under the CARES Act, a foreclosure moratorium and a temporary right to forbearance for homeowners who cannot pay their mortgage due to a COVID-19 hardship. Okay, so let's explain uh, what that means, right? The foreclosure moratorium means that your mortgage servicer, neither your mortgage servicer nor your lender can foreclose on your mortgage for your failure to pay it for 60 days from March 18th to, uh, um, from March 18th, 2020, ending on May 18th, 2020. So they cannot initiate a foreclosure action, foreclose on your home and kick you out of your home for that 60 day period. These provisions, however, don't apply to foreclosures that began before the creation of the act, which was March 27th of uh, 2020 or vacant or abandoned property. But for everyone else, they cannot kick you out of your home for 60 days. 
The other right that you have is that if you're a federally uh, individual borrower with a federally backed mortgage experiencing a financial hardship, you may request a forbearance from your mortgage servicer or lender for up to 180 days, and then you get an additional period of 180 days for a maximum of 360 days. You have to request this from your mortgage servicer. And the proof that the mortgage servicer is going to look for is something like a letter from your employer that you have been laid off, uh, the fact that you, a doctor's note that says that you've been sick as a result of COVID-19. Uh, apparently, they're not going to look for lots of hard proof, but they are going to look for something. And you have to ask for this, and you have to provide it to them. And what that means is that they cannot charge you additional late fees or penalties or interest associated with your failure to pay your mortgage um, during the period of forbearance. So they can't charge additional fees or penalties other than what they would normally charge if you had paid your loan on time during this period of forbearance. Notably, this is not loan forgiveness. This does not mean that you do not have any obligation to pay your loan for the forbearance period. It simply suspends your need to pay during this period. So you ultimately be responsible for all the past due payments that you did not pay after the forbearance period ends. So it doesn't forgive your loan. It doesn't extinguish your obligation to pay. It simply just delays it for the forbearance period. So pay your mortgage if you can, because all those things will just accrue if you don't do it um, on time. Second piece of, um, of protection is for renters. Landlords of covered properties are restricted from filing new evictions for your failure to pay your rent or for non-payment of rent, and they cannot charge you late fees, penalties, or other charges relating to your non-payment of rent. For 120 days from March 27th, which was when the act was put in place, ending on July 25th, 2020. So for 120 days, your landlord cannot evict you if you are in a covered property. Also, even after the eviction moratorium period in 20 days ends, they still, your landlord still cannot evict you after that period without sending you at least a 30 day notice or giving you 30 days of notice, okay? Um, what's a covered property? There's all kinds of things. I encourage you to look at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website for this, but it's Violence Against Women Act covered programs, um, any HUD housing program, and here's a list of them, Section 8, public housing, project-based housing, blah, 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 um, any USDA housing programs, um, programs by the Department of Treasury, such as the Lomka Housing Tax Credit, the LIHTC or LIHTC, rural housing voucher programs, and properties with those federally backed mortgage we just talked about that have between one and four units, um, those properties are covered, and also multifamily large rental properties with five or more units if they are federally backed. Um, so how would you know as a renter if it's a federally backed property? Well, you should really call your um, landlord. They're supposed to tell you um, whether or not you have a federally backed um, uh, rental agreement and whether they're federally backed or they have a federally backed mortgage. But um, that's who should be able to tell you. Um, not, you may be able to look it up on other sources. Last provision that's important is multifamily borrowers with federally backed mortgages that are current as of February 1st and have a hardship due to COVID-19 can also ask for their periods a little different. It's 30 days and it can extend for two different 30-day periods um, if made 15 days prior to the end of the first period. And so it's about 90 days for a multifamily borrower. So if you know you're in a building where your borrower has some federal form of mortgage insurance, et cetera, then you would be covered. They can't evict you during this period of forbearance. Again, this is not rent forgiveness. It doesn't get rid of your obligation to pay rent. It only prevents landlords from evicting you during this period. However, you're still responsible for all past due rent payments after the eviction moratorium period ends. And, they, and at that point, uh, they can, with 30 days notice, evict you. So pay your rent if you can. Okay, and here's my last point. Texas also has some state laws with respect to eviction, basically um, preventing evictions from happening. Um, the state ones till April 30th, I um, anticipate that the court will extend that. Um, and uh, I have a link to that. 
Um, and as I said, you could look at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the National Housing Law Project website, HUD, um, Texas Housers, for in more information about whether or not you're covered and uh, what to do. Biggest point is watch out for scams. There's a lot of um, groups and businesses that are trying to use this crisis as a way to say, hey, I can help you refinance your mortgage if you pay me, or I'm the only one that can help you take advantage of the CARES Act provisions because to buy my product in order to take advantage. And those really all are scams. So just like there's people selling masks that no one can find on websites, <laughs> there's people selling mortgage products that you don't want to buy and don't want to be in. So please be careful of scams. Thank you, and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Professor Alexander. Next, uh, before we turn to our next panelist, I want to uh, give you a little bit more information if you're in the audience. To submit a question electronically, there's a tab at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Just click on that and uh, it'll pull up uh, the ability for you to type in a question. So next, we're going to turn to Professor Herrera. Thank you, Professor Short. Um, well, uh, the Commercial leases is a whole other animal that we thought it was worth talking about because while there are plenty of protections for residential uh, leaseholders, they are, there is not a whole lot for commercial leaseholders in, um, in the CARES Act. There are obviously provisions for businesses, and I will uh, refer those of you who are uh, commercial tenants that have a business to the webinar that was done specifically on some of the resources available for businesses that was done on April 7th, uh, also on the tamulawanswers.info website. So uh, one of the things that I should say about this particular presentation is that because um, leases are governed by state law, um, if you're, call if you're you know, uh, calling in or, or, or chiming in from another state, uh, your particular state's laws might be different than what we're covering here in Texas. I will try to provide some broad overview of some of the theories that may govern your residential leases, but know that a lot of the orders with respect to um, commercial leases are very specific to the jurisdiction that you're in. So Professor Alexander talked about um, eviction, uh, eviction moratoria, and most of them do not explicitly include commercial tenants. However, there are exceptions. For example, in Collin County, here locally, um, the, the order for evictions does explicitly include commercial leases, and that has been also uh, stayed for uh, a period of time. And most of these evictions and throughout the state, we're probably not gonna see a whole lot of action in them until May. And uh, for some counties, it'll be after May 7th, and for others, it might be even further. I believe Dallas County um, has an order that says something like the 24th of May. And so every municipality has a different order, so you really wanna look at what your county orders are. Um, and so you do have a number of counties that don't explicitly, as again, say commercial tenants, but there are that don't specifically also limit to residential. And so that's the case with a number of other counties. Um, uh, Bear County, for example, um, uh, Travis County, for example, also had some very broad um, orders that don't necessarily not include commercial leases. There are um, cities that are making some additional, providing some additional recourse. The city of Austin, for example, has um, asked that or required that um, landlords that are planning to evict that they give tenants a 60 days notice and that is both for residential and for commercial tenants and so uh, my understanding is that they need to provide that notice in addition to all the regular notices that you have to give during an eviction process that they have to uh, give that notice by uh, May 7th or 8th so again a lot of different um, rules and orders that are operating with respect to commercial tenants, but unless you have an order that explicitly says uh, that you are, you, that there is moratorium, you probably should assume that you should continue to pay your rent. Now, 
There is a practical issue, which is that a lot of the justice of the peace courts, or most of them, um, are not going forward with evictions at this time. And so uh, the justice of the peace courts that hear the evictions are probably not going to be hearing anything until probably mid to late May. Um, and if you have a jury trial request, that might even be pushed into June or July. So because there has been a suspension of jury trials and uh, there is a delay in terms of Supreme Court orders for going forward with, with jury trials. And so again, depending on your jurisdiction, uh, that, that really is going to determine when the moratorium will end. Um, as Professor Alexander also said, rental payments are still required. None of this forgives your rental payments. Um, there are very few provisions and rental agreements that allow you to withhold rent. Uh, if you have the money, pay the rent or at least hold on to it so that you're able to make the payment uh, as soon as possible uh, after any moratorium is lifted. Because generally there are very few waivers and the landlords can begin an eviction process for non-payment of rent um, as soon as the moratorium is over. And actually they could still uh, probably file just that the court won't uh, take action on them. So if you, have them, if you don't have the money, you should also think about contacting your property manager or your landlord to request a forbearance or another accommodation. Um, so let me talk a little bit just in, in general about commercial leases, because in addition to some of this court and, and government action that is uh, stopping or delaying, not stopping, but delaying the process of, a, of an eviction, usually how you're going to handle this situation if you're a commercial tenant really is going to depend on your commercial lease and uh, your relationship with your landlord. So, um, so if you don't have a lease agreement, you can still be in a lease due to an oral agreement that you have, but obviously uh, a lease agreement will provide more direction uh, in terms of what, what uh, you might expect a landlord to do. If you don't have anything in writing, you might think about um, definitely putting any agreement that you enter going forward into a writing, even if that's an exchange of emails confirming the agreement. And so it's really important that if a landlord is giving you an extension of time to pay or uh, is entering into a different type of arrangement with you as a commercial tenant, that you properly document those terms. So um, ultimately, you know, whether you can continue to pay uh, your lease is going to determine, determine, be determined based on your own financial, your, you and your business's own financial condition. And so we have um, some tips here about how to think about this. Now, commercial leases are generally contracts. And uh, in Texas, there are two clauses that uh, folks have been citing to as possible areas that might provide some relief for commercial tenants. Um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily uh, certain to provide you relief, but there are two theories. One is the, is the impossibility, the doctrine of impossibility, which basically uh, says that if you, you know, did not foresee an event at the time that your contract was entered into, then you might be able to uh, excuse the performance of, of your obligation under that contract. And here, the, your contract is the lease. Um, Texas courts have interpreted this doctrine of impossibility to require more than just a difficulty, an economic difficulty or an economic hardship or expense. So it's not necessarily a low bar that as a tenant you would have to prove to prove that you can no longer comply with the terms of your lease. Um, and it is up to you as the, the tenant to, to make the case that uh, it is impossible to go forward. Uh, ultimately, you have to make reasonable efforts to make sure that you can still perform. And so if you're able to operate your business online, uh, a landlord and probably a court will expect you to do that as a way to generate uh, income. In terms of uh, additional theories, the force majeure theory is another commonly used. Basically it means there's a superior force, there's a, a chance occurrence that really interfered in your contract with your ability to perform. Basically that something was unavoidable. Uh, in Texas, the force majeure clauses are, are construed narrowly, which means that if you have a force majeure clause, you need to make sure that um, it would have to say there's, you know, 
A force majeure is usually defined and very commonly it's defined in, to include things like tornadoes in Texas or other um, you know, issues that, that might come up that might prevent a business from operating. But I don't know that there's going to be a whole lot of force majeure clauses that are going to specifically um, list a pandemic. And so m most likely your lease does not include any provision for you to um, excuse the, the payment of rent through this clause. However, uh, there might be broad terms that could excuse you. So, um, so maybe uh, something like something I have here on the PowerPoint or such other events that are beyond the reasonable control of tenant. So I think those are the two areas and two provisions that you might look to in your lease that might provide some relief, uh, but they are not necessarily foolproof. Uh, regardless of, of whether this is in your contract or not, <laughs> uh, and if it uh, allows you to get out of this lease, landlords, um, you should know that generally can charge late fees and penalties uh, if the lease provides uh, for them to do so. And unless there's an ordering, order limiting them uh, to charge late fees or penalties, um, you should expect that to accrue if you've decided to not pay uh, your rent until the moratorium uh, is lifted. So uh, I have here an example of a county, uh, Dallas County order that was um, uh, issued on April 6th that says Lord, uh, landlords should cap late fees for delayed payment of rent at $15 per month. Again, I added the italics there on the should because it's not mandatory. It's up to the landlord if they want to do that. And um, I'm not sure that if uh, I was a landlord, I wouldn't necessarily be jumping at the opportunity to, to uh, delay any, any fees if I'm also strapped for cash uh, during this time. So um, there are uh, also opportunities for landlords under our Texas property code um, to to lock you out of your business if you um, did not pay rent. And so that's something else that I know that there have been a number of businesses here in Fort Worth who are dealing with this issue. Um, if the t landlord does shut you out because you did not pay your rent, you must, uh, the landlord must, the landlord, and I say landlord, it could also be the property manager, it could be the landlord's agent, must place a written notice on the tenant's front door stating the uh, the name of the person and the address or number where you can contact either an individual or the property management company that um, that would allow you a key, a new key, if they change the lock, to be able to go in to your um, to your business and get whatever you need to. So uh, the new key is only going to be required to be provided uh, during the tenant's regular business hours and if the tenant pays the delinquent rent. So if you didn't pay your rent, and um, you, you're not prepared to pay your rent, it's gonna be hard to get back in. Um, so there are obviously provisions that are in the law if you pay your rent or offering to pay the rent and the landlord still doesn't accept it, you could um, uh, request a writ of re-entry to go back in, but it's probably going to require that you uh, pay some rent uh, if a landlord locks you out and um, does so uh, after you've paid rent, you have some um, ability to either terminate the lease or to receive some damages for that lockout, which could be a month's rent and reasonable attorney's fees and other things that you might be um, eligible for uh, under the property code. So, um, so lots to, to think about there. I mean, this is really an overview of landlord-tenant law for, um, for commercial properties, ultimately. What's really going to make sense is probably to stay out of court because the courts are going to delay the process and ultimately sour any existing good relationship that you might have with your landlord. So you might think about negotiating with your landlord. And I've posted here some, some tips or some ideas about what uh, a landlord might consider and a tenant might consider when they're going into a negotiation to restructure a lease or rethink about it. Uh, most landlords will want to keep a tenant because uh, hard times are around for everyone, not just the small uh, business, but also the, the larger ones. And so it's going to be important for them to, <clears throat> to work with you. Uh, they will probably require that you provide more financial information to make sure that any promise of future payment 
is actually secure. So don't be surprised if you enter into an agreement with a landlord and the landlord asks for more either financial informations or other guarantees to your lease if you're intending to contribute. Obviously, some things to think about as you're deciding whether it makes sense for you to terminate your lease or negotiate um, a lump sum payment or a payment plan or anything else uh, is how much you've already invested in that space. Have you put in a lot of money in tenant improvements? And if that's the case, you might want to uh, figure out how to uh, add whatever delinquent rent is available at a later time. So just some tips on, on how to negotiate. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time here, so I'm not going to go through every single point. Um, I will say that uh, in terms of a, an eviction process, a lot of people, once they get a notice of eviction, they think they have to move out immediately, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, after you get a notice of eviction, you have at least three days uh, before the landlord will file an eviction in court, and then you would have an opportunity to go before a judge. Again, this is what's been postponed uh, until May, and, and the date of when in May depends on your jurisdiction. Um, ultimately, if, they, if the landlord does get a writ of possession, which basically means an order uh, for them to take over the property if you don't move within the time permitted to you by the court. Um, a constable can come in, uh, give you notice, and within 24 hours they could remove your uh, belongings from the uh, location where you're at. Uh, you have five days to appeal that decision, and ultimately, uh, if you're not successful, this all goes down to debt collection, and obviously uh, any eviction, any record of an eviction on your record will prevent you from possibly going into uh, getting a new lease. And so those are all considerations for you. There are a number of other issues that come up when we deal with um, commercial leases. Uh, generally, there's been some support and funding to help in, uh, residential uh, tenants with paying their utilities. I have not seen anything that says that commercial uh, tenants have the same opportunities. Uh, you want to consider whether you or somebody else, a uh, family member, or anybody else in your business has a personal guarantee that might be uh, at risk here when you are um, leaving a lease. Um, if you have business interruption insurance, you want to make sure you call your agent. A lot of folks don't, but if you're the bigger the landlord, the most likely they are to require it. So you want to make sure you put in a call to your insurance agent if you have business interruption insurance. And really, this is going to give you an opportunity, unfortunately, to think about whether it makes sense to either sell or transfer your business to somebody who might have more liquidity than you to be able to sustain this time. And so obviously, that might lead you to recovery um, uh, if you're able to have enough cash flow to hold on during this period. And if not, you might have to consider bankruptcy options, which my colleague, um, Professor Wayne Barnes, will, will talk about. Uh, again, I, I refer to the CARES Act resources for small business that was discussed on April 7th and our webinar uh, you can find on our website. If you have other questions, the Texas Law Help web, excuse me, website has some specific information that gives you uh, more details about the specific order that orders that end the moratoriums. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we have about 25 minutes left in our webinar today. So we're gonna hear from Professor Wayne Barnes uh, next about bankruptcy issues. And we have questions that are now um, coming in on our Q&A and we're gonna to turn to those right after Professor Barnes. All right, thank you, Professor Short. Let me pull up my PowerPoint and given uh, the nature of the hour, I will try to be quick. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, bankruptcy related provisions of the, the CARES Act. W one obvious question, I suspect a lot of our audience, um, from the questions we've seen thus far, I'm suspecting that a lot of our audience is dealing with this from the, the residential side. So you're worrying about your home or your apartment. Um, and so I, I suspect we're going to talk a lot about that to set the stage and the context for that, though I do want to actually talk about um, what the CARES Act does with respect to bankruptcy. because. Spoiler alert, the, the CARES Act doesn't really change any of some of the normal bankruptcy provisions that you might want to utilize uh, in the coming days if you want to file um, for bankruptcy. Uh, but I do want to just set the stage, talk a little bit about what basic um, bankruptcy options there are as far as what chapters to file. I'll talk briefly about what the CARES Act does to bankruptcy, and then I suspect we can talk about 
uh, typical options in the Q&A. So just real quickly, type of bankruptcy cases, there's really three, uh, really almost only two that most individuals would worry about. And the first one is chapter seven. So you file chapter seven bankruptcy, that's known as a straight liquidation. You're basically giving up all of your non-exempt assets and, um, and saying Here, here's what's available for my creditors. Um, you get to keep your future income, so your, your paycheck going forward, you don't have to use any of that going forward after you file bankruptcy. The, the good news is that most, many at least, um, ordinary folks and debtors that want to file bankruptcy who are consumers um, don't have any non-exempt assets because, as you may be aware, in Texas, your homestead is uh, exempt in an unlimited dollar amount, uh, one car for every licensed uh, driver in the household. Uh, a certain amount of personal furnishings, your retirement, all that kind of stuff. And so that's usually a lot of times all most folks have. So you don't really have to give up anything. The bankruptcy court just gives you a discharge and you get rid of all of your obligation on debts. Um, for some folks though, chapter 13 is an option. And what chapter 13 sets up is basically a probably a five year, maybe only a three year uh, payment plan where you pay your creditors what you can. Uh, the good news of that is you don't have to give up any of your assets. You don't have to liquidate anything. You just commit your future income. Uh, and the idea is that most folks that file chapter 13 have some income uh, over and above their living expenses. Then of course, for businesses, there's also um, the option of chapter 11. Um, and you know, a normal chapter 11 case is, was contemplated for large uh, corporations, you know, American Airlines files uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy, um, for instance, and that is an, an enormously complex and expensive process. Lots of lawyers involved, lots of constituencies are represented um, from the debtor to a large creditors committee to the trustee. Um, and, and that is out of reach for many, many, if not the vast majority of the small businesses in the United States. What's interesting, it's just kind of fortuitous that there just happened to be a new small business debtor reorganization subchapter that was just um, enacted last year and only became effective about a month ago. It's hardly been used yet. And so I'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, so to get to the CARES Act really quickly, and then when I get to the Q&A, um, the CARES Act just has um, a handful of provisions that affect bankruptcy, both for businesses and for um, individuals. So I want to talk about businesses first. The small business debtor reorganization chapter that I just talked about just became effective about a month and a half ago, two months ago almost. Um, the good news is it's almost like chapter 13 for, for larger businesses. Um, or rather larger than individuals, so small to medium-sized businesses. Um, and so it's simple, it's fast, there's no voting process, there's not a lot of the complexities that are involved in a typical more um, large corporate Chapter 11. So it's very, very attractive, but we really don't know a lot about how it's playing out because it really just became effective in late February, and of course now we know the world completely changed. Um, the thing that frustrated some about the new Small Business Debtor Reorganization Act was that they limited it to, as you can see, businesses that only had total debt of $2.7 million or so or less. A lot of businesses have more debt than that, so they're not eligible to file for this simple, faster Chapter 11. That brings me to the first of the CARES Act provisions, though. For one year, starting from the effective date of the Act, and I don't have that date in front of me, I want to say it's late March, um, they decided to temporarily raise the debt limit for eligible businesses to file this new, smaller, faster Chapter 11 up to, if you have up to $7.5 million in debt. So that vastly um, expands the amount of small to medium-sized businesses that can take advantage of this very, very effective, simple, um, efficient Chapter 11 process. I don't know if there's a lot in our audience that are going to be interested in a, in a business bankruptcy, but that's one of the things they did, and it's going to be very helpful for the undoubted wave of bankruptcy filings of a lot of small to medium businesses that are coming in the coming months. Um, then how about for individuals? I suspect most of our um, audience. Well, before I tell you what the act does for individuals, and this is fairly minor, um, well, it's not minor, but it's fairly modest um, addition to, to the bankruptcy act, but it, but it is helpful. Uh, but before I explain it to you, I'm going to have to explain to you a little bit about the so-called means test in bankruptcy and how disposable income works. So we talked a while ago about Chapter 7, which is you don't have to pay any income in the future. You just give up your assets. Uh, a lot of times you don't have any assets, so it's sort of a zero asset bankruptcy. So you essentially give up nothing 
uh, and you, your, your debt is wiped out. As opposed to chapter 13, where you're required or you uh, contemplate paying payments over a three to five year period. Well, there is this means test that um, Congress enacted about 15 years ago. And what they look at, you know, the, the short version of it is this. If you have enough means, enough income, they want you to file Chapter 13. They want you to use that means and that income to pay your creditors as much as you can over five years. If you don't have enough means, then you don't have to do that. That's sort of the real simplified version. So the way the bankruptcy code does that is it looks at your uh, current monthly income. It's a six month average leading up to before the bankruptcy filing. And they look at what the relevant median income. So if you're a single male uh, living in Tarrant County, they say, well, what is the median income of single male or single family person household in Tarrant County? Uh, and if you're under that, then you can file chapter seven, no problem. Um, if your current monthly income, say you're a single, or let's say you're a family of five that lives in Dallas County, and then you compare that to the relevant median income of a family of five in Dallas County, if you're over that, then not so fast, maybe you can file chapter seven, maybe not. Then we further look at how much disposable income you have. So what the, the court does is it looks at your gross monthly income, your paycheck typically, um, minus certain allowed living expenses. So what you gotta pay to, for rent or your mortgage, what you gotta pay in taxes, healthcare, groceries, utilities, car expenses, et cetera. And then they look at that leftover, you know, what you normally use to you know, buy you know, luxury items with or go to the movies maybe once or twice more, went back when people did that. And that leftover money after your, your, your bare living expenses is called your disposable kind of leftover income. And they look at that and they say, okay, this is what this person has left over to apply to their debts. And then they essentially say, and it's a complex formula, I don't nearly have enough time to get into it right now, but suffice it to say, it's roughly targeted to if you can pay at least 25% of your overall unsecured debt like credit card or medical bills. And it says, if you can pay at least some amount of it, this percentage of it, then you know what, you're required to file chapter 13. You have to commit all of your disposable income for the next five years or possibly three years. But if, you know what, you barely have a little bit of disposable income, it's only a few dollars a month, then it's probably not gonna be enough. And they say, you know what, you have a little bit of extra disposable income, but we're not gonna make you file chapter 13. You can just file chapter seven. And you know, chapter seven, you get in and out within a matter of you know, weeks, if not two or three months. So that, okay, so that's the backdrop. And with that, I'm almost done. What the CARES Act does for individuals is this. You all, hopefully some of you have already received your stimulus payments and other funds uh, from the CARES Act. The standard was $1,200 per adult, and perhaps depending on who you are, there's other funds available. Um, but, but the bankruptcy debtors get to keep these stimulus payments um, from the CARES Act, either current people that are already filing bankruptcy or that are thinking and contemplating filing it. You get to keep it. So uh, under those income tests I just told you about, it's not included. So you don't have to say, oh, wow, I suddenly got a pay bump from this uh, federal stimulus check. You don't have to count that in making these various calculations as to whether you make enough uh, and whether you have to commit that income. So short answer, payments don't go to the creditors. Debtors get to keep that money and it's not held against you for purposes of whether you file chapter, um, 11, uh, chapter 7 or 13. The other thing, and this is really a very narrow segment of my audience. I don't know if any of you are currently in a chapter. 13 case, but if you already are in a chapter 13 case and say you're under a five-year plan and then suddenly this disaster has happened, um, what Congress did is realize, wow, there's going to be some extenuating circumstances. Normally, chapter 13 plans can only go for five years, but there's a provision in the act that explicitly authorizes the court for this uh, time duration to extend plans for seven years to allow everyone to get back on their feet. Um, and again, this is very narrow, only if you're currently in a chapter 13, but that's the other thing uh, that the CARES Act does. So uh, I wanted to make it short and sweet. The summary recap, those are the three things. Uh, increases the uh, debt amount for small business organizations of chapter 11 to 7.5 million. That's for one year. Um, CARES Act payments are not included in income or disposable income for purposes of individual bankruptcies. And if you happen to be an existing chapter 13 debtor, you can extend your plan for up to seven years. And these provisions will sunset, that is they will go away um, after one year from the effective date. So next March, 2021, unless they're extended, which of course in the current flux, anything is possible. But that's what Congress has done 
at this moment. So with that, I want to leave the rest of the time for our questions from our um, moderator and our audience, and I look forward to them. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor Barnes. Okay, so I'm going to go through and uh, pull out a couple of questions that have been asked so far, and uh, we have about 14 minutes left on the webinar. So I ask our, our panelists if we could uh, keep our answers as direct and, and to the point as we can so we can try to get through a number of questions. Um, so first for Professor Alexander, we have uh, received a couple of questions related to uh, landlords who typically have college students as tenants. So I'm going to read you a couple of these questions. Uh, as a landlord, college students are not wanting to sign a lease because they're not sure if they will be in town for part or all of the fall or spring this coming year. What support is there for landlords who are not able to rent their properties? Many students are not renewing leases because they're not sure if we will have classes in the fall. We as landlords may lose out on renting our units. What support does the CARES Act have to assist landlords? So um, the provisions that I was talking about mainly um, apply to um, individuals. And there are some provisions for landlords who receive some sort of their mortgages in some way supported. So if, for example, you're a landlord and you're receiving something from the university through the Department of Education, perhaps you would qualify as a multifamily landlord and you can request for grants if you meet the definition of a multifamily federally backed landlord. You can request that 90-day period of forbearance. But the other provisions that really pertain to landlords, I think, are in some of the other sections of the CARES Act the sections that pertain to small businesses, and we had a webinar, so I would look at that. Um, those are more what to do if you're a business that's failing. The provisions that I was talking about are more do if you're a tenant or a mortgage holder can't pay your mortgage. Fantastic, thank you. And just as a reminder yeah, to our, oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, and with respect to students, um, yeah, if you want to be around, you know, you have about 120 days to not be evicted <laughs> um, until you can figure out your next step. Thank you very much. Okay, for Professor Herrera, lease and rent for our business. Um, this is a question about lease and rent for our business that has been completely shut down. What are our rights and best way to manage with no revenue coming in? We own a banquet hall and most of our business is wedding receptions. And then I know that you talked a little bit about this, but I don't know if you want to add any detail. The Texas Supreme Court order prohibiting uh, residential evictions. Uh, do local governments have the power to expand that to commercial tenancies? And I guess I'd add on to that. Do you know how widespread that is um, in Texas beyond Tarrant County? Um, well, again, I, I think local municipalities do have the ability to, to extend, and we've seen it again in Collin County explicitly. Um, so, and there are cities, like I mentioned, the city of Austin has added some provisions that include um, notice for additional time so that people can prepare and understand uh, whether they're going to be evicted so so there is that in terms of you know not having your business shut down honestly like what what you're going to do with it really depends on how much liquidity how much savings you have if you're able to ride the storm out or not if you're not able to get a, um, a loan and i understand that there's been a number of uh, federal programs that have already run out of funding um, you might also consider contacting your local uh, chamber of commerce and small um, uh, and community development departments for the city for the county and the city that you live in to ask if there's any additional funds that are going to be made available for small businesses um, so it's really you know kind of talking to local lenders about um, your situation is probably the best way i'd also reach out to some of your business counselors individuals and organizations such as um, score um, have individuals that might be able to walk you through your plan. But, you know, for some people, unfortunately, the answer might not be that um, you have any good recourse. 
I do think it's important to talk with your landlord and see if they will provide some accommodation for you. And I would start there. Um, and if they do not, then I think you, you need to consider other options. And, and for some, bankruptcy might be a solution. Thank you. And just as a reminder to everybody, we do have our prior webinars and transcripts videos available online. Uh, and there's great information there, in particular, uh, as our panelists have said about small businesses. So Professor Barnes, do homeowners or tenants have any options to deal with past due payments in bankruptcy? Yeah, so um, that's probably the number of questions on a lot of people's minds. And um, the answer is yes. Um, I can tell you there are those of you that, uh, one thing about chapter 13 versus chapter seven, there's some, there's some requirements for chapter 13 that I didn't mention. And one of them is that you have to um, have so-called regular income. So the, con the, the, the general thought is that you've got a job and you got a regular paycheck. It doesn't have to be a paycheck uh, and a regular job. It could, you know, if you're an independent contractor or a gig worker, that's probably sufficient. But the idea is that you have some income coming in with regularity. Now, I know there's a lot of unfortunate folks out there right now that have been laid off. And so that's not you at the moment. And so chapter 13 may not be, probably is not an immediate option. For those of you that have regular income though, chapter 13 is actually rather an amazing tool for dealing with that. So for those of you with uh, you know, mortgages, um, we've talked a lot about these um, and Professor Alexander and Professor Herrera both mentioned that these moratorium on, moratoria on uh, and forbearance on, you, you don't have to pay your payments for a while, whether it's two months or four months, but that, that's not going away. So you do have those arrearages or those, or those past due payments. Um, and I've seen some questions in the Q and A about, aren't surely they're going to work with us on that? And I think the answer is the vast majority of banks will. But but to the, to bankruptcy, Chapter Thirteen has the ability. Say you're say you're five months behind, you can file Chapter Thirteen and start. You know, say you file on May twentieth, you can make your June first mortgage payment and keep current going forward and you can pay those four or five you don't even have to negotiate this with your bank you can package those four or five past due payments and pay them out over the five-year life of your plan and break them up and so that alone is a really huge valuable tool um, that you have in chapter 13. chapter 7 it's more subject to you can you can keep your your mortgage but uh, you'll basically be subject to having to negotiate the terms of that with your um, your mortgage lender. In normal times, we say as long as you're not in default, you can probably just reaffirm it and, and carry it forward. And I suspect a lot of that will happen as well in Chapter 7. But, but the good news is you really can take care of those past two payments in Chapter 13. So that may be one way that a lot of folks who are taking advantage of not paying may go into bankruptcy and then just kind of take care of it that way. Of course, you can always try to negotiate and I suspect banks will will work with people because they realize people aren't going to magically have six months of payments or four months of payments when this all smoke clears. Thank you very much and to follow up on uh, what Professor Barnes was just saying uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A about payments following the forbearance period and concern that uh, folks have lost their jobs and trying to come up with a lump sum uh, after the forbearance period is over is going to be nearly impossible and clearly anxiety about that potential. So I uh, wonder if Professor Alexander or Professor Herrera could speak to that. So, so one thing, I, the provisions that I talked about about the CARES Act applied to, you know, federally backed mortgages and federally covered tenants. But even if you're in private um, tenant situation or you have a privately owned mortgage, you should still call your mortgage service and your lender, try to have a loan mitigation or a workout. Also, by the CARES Act provisions, you already know based on your situation that a hundred is, is not going to be enough. You're still not going to be able to make payments after that. You should contact your landlord, your mortgage lender or servicer and try to work out negotiated terms. So for example, if you know it's going to be hard to pay after the forbearance period, your lender may have different options. They may be able to spread out your payments over a certain period of time. They may be able to renegotiate some of the terms of your loan so you don't own as much. 
Um, and so it's important to communicate early in the process with your servicer or lender to figure out what workouts you can have. Um, notably, in 2008, when we had another kind of financial economic crisis, that was a financial crisis. Um, but it wasn't a public health crisis as well. And it wasn't even as bad as it was on the same scale of what we're dealing with now. So I think landlords and um, lenders have a lot of, and servicers have incentives to try to work things out because they have so many people who aren't going to make payments. Um, they have incentives to do that. Um, but so you should ask for that even to see what you can negotiate and to see what you can do. Um, as Professor Herrera had also said with respect to commercial tenants, it's the same thing. You should try to work out what you can. Um, but that having been said, one other point I wanted to make is that although the care Act says specifically what landlords cannot do and what servicers and lenders cannot do. Um, it doesn't mean everyone's going to follow those rules. Um, and so there may be landlords who, you know, kind of send you a letter saying, hey, hey, we're ready to evict you and da 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 da. And it may be misinformation in terms of what they're legally allowed to do, but they still may send you that information. And so you need to be very careful about. Um, calling your servicer, calling your lender, making sure that they are following the rules and not sending you letters saying you have to get out in 20 days when you actually have other rights. Thank you very much. We have one question. Uh, if eviction proceedings commence, would it be a good strategy to request a jury trial to give us time to get back on our fees? Professor Herrera, you wanna take a shot at that one? Yeah, I mean, generally the answer is yes, even if we don't have a pandemic, because it could take a little bit longer. And particularly now when you have jury trials that were suspended in all civil matters, um, I think it could actually buy quite a bit of time. How much depends on, on every court's docket, but it's possible that if you are requesting a jury trial and, uh, you know, uh, evictions don't begin again until early May, it's possible that you can, a jury trial could delay it until June or even July in some jurisdictions. Very good. So I, I wanna uh, make sure that the audience sees that in the Q&A, our panelists have been hard at work behind the scenes answering questions. And, uh, and so if we don't uh, talk here in the video about your question, you should look online and at the transcript and, and uh, the Q&A to find those answers. We have just a few um, remaining open questions and we have two minutes. And my one job is to make sure we stop at one. So I'm gonna shut y'all down in two minutes, but can we get quick answers on these? Uh, first, to be clear, we can't be evicted until that court proceeding occurs, correct? Yes, yes. correct. <laughs> Had to unmute. Okay. Fantastic, okay. So we have a couple of questions about the GSA and those questions have, have not been answered. I don't know that our panelists um, have much expertise in that area and so I don't wanna force them into this, but, but do we know anything about the GSA's ability to pay rent or meet lease obligations or whether they're sheltered in any way under the CARES Act? I don't, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, can you, the GSA is confusing me. I can't really see the question, so about the government the general services administration so the government uh, uh as a as a, a tenant whether they can whether there's is there anything in the act that we're aware of that, that covers the government uh as a tenant oh the government as a tenant um no not that i'm aware of okay okay all right. Um, well, thank you all so much for being with us today. It has been a pleasure. And thank you very much to our three panelists for their uh, time and their expertise. I want to remind everybody that uh, this webinar will be available in about a day, but our prior three webinars related to the CARES Act are all available at TAMU, tamulawanswers.info. The video, the transcript, and all the presenter slides. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, I hope you're all healthy and staying safe. Have a good afternoon.